It suddenly occurred to me the other day that I actually do know an appellate lawyer who in their spare time competes in, guess what sport? Boxing. I did promise this person that I wouldn't throw them in the deep end and quote them directly, so I won't be mentioning any names. What I did was sent through the photographs of Officer John O'Keefe's injuries that were submitted to the court by Karen Reed's defence team and I asked, does this face look like he had a run-in with an MMA boxer, in your opinion? Defence says, punched in the face, fell back and hit his head, defensive wounds on hands, you may have seen these type of injuries. This person replies, the first four photos look pretty consistent with injuries from a hand-to-hand -hand fight. The third looks like a pretty classic boxer's fracture. They go on to say that they don't recognise the other injuries on the arms, etc. But of course, once I inform this person that the arm lacerations, the defence says, was a German Shepherd, they confer that it looks pretty consistent with that type of injury. Of course, neither of us are medical examiners but I just so happened to find an actual medical examiner commenting on these exact photos. You may recognise her as the medical examiner who exhumed Stephen Smith's body from the Alex Murdar cases. So let's tune in and see what she says. So joining me to discuss what we do know about the autopsy results for John O'Keefe is somebody who has performed many autopsies in her time. She is Dr. Michelle Dupree. She's a retired medical examiner. Dr. Dupree, thanks for coming on. Um, we know that you haven't seen the autopsy report, but you've looked at some of these photographs that I found online and sent to you of John O'Keefe's injuries. And tell me, um, first of all, you know, we see that there's a big gash on the back of John O'Keefe's head. So tell me, what could that have been caused by in your opinion? Well, that's a laceration, um, which means that he struck something hard. Um, maybe it was cement, maybe it was um, a rock or, the, or you know, something like that, um, but a hard object. Um, and that could very easily cause multiple skull fractures. There's been a lot of talk um, online, and we know that there was a suggestion by the defense team in this case that John O'Keefe, was not hit by a vehicle, that he was possibly beaten up inside the house on Fairview Road, possibly attacked by a dog, and then left in the snow to die. So let's talk a little bit about uh, that possibility, because if you look at these autopsy photos, John O'Keefe does have swollen black eyes. Um, it does almost look like he's been in some type of fight. The medical examiner, according to the prosecutors said that she did not believe he had been in any type of physical altercation that 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 swelling and that bleeding was caused by small fractures in the skull right well, you know there is some credibility i think from looking at the photos and um you know a little caveat here they're they're not the best photos so there's some margin of error however when we see black eyes we call them raccoon eyes and they can come from a skull fracture but that skull fracture is a particular type of fracture known as a basal or skull fracture, which is what your, your brain actually sits on top of. And it's fracturing those very small, thin bones where your eyes are. And then there does um, cause the black eyes from the bleeding there. However, one of the things that I was puzzled by in reading the reports is there's a small um, laceration or cut above his right eye. That typically comes from being struck. So if you're struck in the eye, say you're punched and, and getting a black eye, you may have a little cut of the skin right above that. So that leads some credibility to him possibly having been in a fight. I'm not sure how you would get a small cut like that from being struck by a car, more facial injuries. Um, when a car, of course, it's a large object, when it hits you, something else is going to be damaged. So that does lead to, to some credibility. Why would the ME, if he had possibly been into a fight, she's saying she didn't see any evidence of that. Um, there are some kind of bruises or some discoloration, I should say, to uh, his hands and his knuckles. There is. And again, that's usually indicative of someone being in an altercation of some kind. Um, he, he has bruises and contusions on the back of his hand. Um, 
And as far as the Emmy not thinking that he had been in an altercation, that's a matter of interpretation. Um, you know, she obviously did not think that there was enough evidence to suggest that. Um, I'm simply saying that I think there is a possibility that he may have actually been in a fight, given some of that, um, that evidence that we see. Very interesting, right? I can already hear Plevin Dapper going, oh my God, total boy got to a... You can't just write off seemingly intelligent people with educations and PhDs, etc. just because you've got an issue with Total Boy. Anyway, I do digress. What does the medical examiner think of the dog bites? There may have been some other, I guess, contributing factors. The scratches and the abrasions on his arm, there's several of them and they're linear. Those are not typically what we see from being hit by a car. Um, I can't say that they look like dog scratches necessarily, um, but, it, but it would be unusual to receive those from being hit by a car. We often see something called road rash, which is several um, scratches and abrasions you know, on the surface of the skin. That is not what these are. These are very different. So I don't think you can rule out that possibility. Okay, so maybe it's a bit of a stretch for a medical examiner to say, yeah, that's 100% a dog bite. Who would they defer to for more advice about what a dog bite might look like? Well, it just so happens I found a video on that as well. And this is by attorney Melanie Little. Her guest is Garrett Wing. And you can go to her channel and see the full video. I'm just going to show you like a minute or so to get the point across. I probably, I can pretty much guarantee you, I've seen more dog bites than most any medical examiner. And, and I would say that because people don't often die from dog bites. Uh, very rare, even police dog bites, which can be very serious and very gruesome. Uh, so I don't think medical examiners get to see a lot of dog bites uh, on dead bodies. It's just doesn't happen. Now we're talking about gunshot wounds and I'd be a little bit out of my league there. Uh, but when it comes to dog bites, I can't even tell you how many I have seen. Uh, but I thought your, your viewers would find it interesting how we get police dogs to bite and kind of the mechanics of the bite. And some of the, like I said, the equipment that we use, and I actually brought some. Oh, yeah. um, and so uh, a dear friend of mine, actually, Steve Sprouse, who's been in the police canine world for probably almost four decades, uh, invented this equipment that I want to show you now. Mm -hmm. And his company is called Armin Lagan. And what he does is he creates these prosthetic limbs specifically made for teaching police dogs how to bite. And this particular one has a little bit more than a handful of bites on it. Um, the idea here being we set up a scenario, a training scenario with a, you know, a bad guy. I'll play the bad guy, let's say. The dog, by the way, does not know it's a training scenario. That's the ticket. That's the trick uh, in all dog training, by the way, whether it's pet dogs or police dogs. They don't know whether they're training or not. We try to make it as real to life as possible. So the dog comes out. We hide. Dog finds the bad guy. And the only thing we try to make available is this because this is the only thing stopping us from getting really bit there's no other protection and i want to show you you see the lacerations that are caused from dog bites you're not really seeing punctures it looks as if this was stabbed with a knife now that's the closest to a puncture but for the most part it's ripping it's a ripping type thing dogs bite and they pull and at the same time we are naturally pulling back to create our own back tension, uh, which is exactly what, you know, what a rabbit would do in the wild. You know what I mean? A, a rabbit doesn't, we call them, there's no such thing as suicide bunnies. If a bunny or any other prey item is getting bit, th their whole objective is to get away, get away, get away. Um, and that's where you get the, the lacerations that happen. So that's one piece. And here's another one, by the way, tell me if this doesn't look kind of similar to something we may see a little later. Pretty interesting, right? Don't mind the discoloration. This was just a funky um, mold. But again, look at the lacerations. And I have to kind of spread it because of the material, but they're more like cut wounds. And you can see the angle, right? It's pretty consistent, depending upon how you present, how you present it. So very interesting indeed. Once again, link to the full video is down below. And thank you, Melanie, for having Garrett as a guest on your channel to show us what a dog biting expert might say. Now, where were we? 
Oh, that's right. I also showed this person, who is an appellate lawyer, the quote, crime scene, unquote, photos. I didn't even get a chance to explain anything. Immediately they replied, Good Lord, no evidence markers? Nothing for scale? And they seriously moved the body first? Sounds shady as. And I wasn't even surprised that they were able to spot all of those things, just like all of us were able to spot those things. I'm predicting some chain of custody issues in the coming court proceedings. Chain of custody procedure protects everyone involved with a crime scene. It is the procedure, documentation, tracking and protection of evidence on its journey from a crime scene to the courtroom. If the chain of custody is broken, it can't be repaired. Suddenly, the defendant and the legal team have a way to ask the judge to declare the evidence inadmissible to even be presented in court. The legitimacy of the evidence is now forever suspect, and the defendant's legal team will file a motion to suppress evidence based on a broken chain of custody. Once declared inadmissible, it cannot be used in any way to help hold the defendant accountable. It is now called tainted evidence. If the now tainted evidence is the only evidence tying a defendant to a crime, no charges can be brought against them or the case will be dismissed. Interesting, right? This is what the next couple of court hearings will be about. They're called motions in limine and limine is Latin for at the start or on the threshold. So these are things that have happened prior to the actual jury trial and during motions in limine a party seeks to exclude prejudicial or irrelevant evidence or they may wish to obtain a ruling on whether the court will admit exculpatory evidence and we now know Auntie Bev is way past dismissing the case so I very much doubt that she's going to dismiss on the basis of broken chains of custody. Nearly everything that came from the crime scene, which was not sectioned off with crime scene tape and protected from contamination, pretty much everything else has no evidence markers and nothing for scale. And so far we've seen very little evidence of chain of custody. I don't think they've even got any metadata on the taillight photos to prove what time they were taken. I could be wrong, but it seems to me that the cell phones used at the crime scene to take the photos at the crime scene and of Karen's vehicle once they had it in their custody, DA Morrissey gave the green light for them to destroy those cell phones. That's not quite the same as, you know, a digital piece of equipment just fouled up and stuff got lost. That's the very definition of egregious misconduct. And the fact that Aunty Bev isn't seeing it that way isn't going to change the way the appellate court sees it. I won't read Aunty Bev's denial of the motion to disqualify. I will let you go and listen to attorney Melanie Little read it to you because she gives a whole lot more context, being a lawyer, of course. And I will leave a link in the description below so you can go visit her channel. Make sure you subscribe and like her videos. Uh, I, fi I do find it interesting that one shoe was on and one was off. Um, and, and you do see that in accidents or in incidents where somebody is hit by a vehicle and thrown um, that sometimes they can be knocked out of their shoes. Uh, what did you make of that? He has one shoe on, one shoe off. Yes, and, and you're absolutely right. When we see motor vehicle pedestrian um, collisions, we often see that. However, I don't think that's likely in this case because when we see that type of um, event happen, the person is struck by a vehicle. Um, they're basically picked up um, off the ground and, and flown out of their shoes from a, usually a pretty high rate of impact. And I don't think that um, in this case, there was that significant high rate of impact to throw him out of his shoe. I think that maybe he was just disoriented. Um, it just got knocked off or something of that nature. These are the kinds of conversations you're going to have when the evidence files are missing things like 
the date that the second shoe was found, where the second shoe was found. Maybe the defence has this information and they just haven't published it yet, but so far I haven't found anything that indicates where or when the second shoe was found. If the ME were told the second shoe was found in the driveway, 27 metres away from where his body was found, would she have come to the same conclusion that he might have just stumbled out of his own shoe? The jury is going to be just as much in the dark as anybody else unless those exhibits show the exact time and day the second shoe was found and where. And it was January. It's a bl there's it, there's a blizzard going on. So yeah. John O'Keefe, as we saw in the surveillance footage from the bar, uh, was wearing long sleeves. So where those scratches would have come from it is kind of curious uh, to me. Exactly. And, you know, it would be interesting to see the clothing that he was wearing and match up those injuries with that clothing, because obviously the clothing must have been torn in some way. Um, does it look like it was, you know, shredded by dog nails or, or whatever it may be? Um, but again, those are some of the, I guess, rather contradictory evidence findings in this case. Indeed, it would be interesting to see the clothing. If Officer O'Keefe was not wearing the same hoodie when he was found versus the one he was wearing at the bar, then we can presume that it's adverse to the Commonwealth. I mean, let's face it, he's not going to be knocked out of his hoodie, is he? So I agree, it will be interesting. As you know, I'm a former law enforcement officer, and we have a saying that we look at that totality of circumstances. We don't just look at one particular thing. And so in this case, I think that's what it's going to be. We need to look at the whole surrounding circumstances. We need to look at the evidence. You know, there was evidence that um, one of the people at the party um, Googled how long does it take to die from being out in the cold. Well, that's really weird, you know, and there are some other very odd things. When you look at all of that evidence, and ultimately, of course, as you know, it will be up to the jury to decide. This will be a very interesting case.